Good afternoon. Welcome to Paraspur lecture organized by the Office of Communication, Indian Institute of Science. The topic of today's lecture is the discovery of helium and distortion in the history of science by Professor Biman Binat. Before we begin, let me give a brief introduction of the speaker today. Professor Biman Binat studied physics at the University of Delhi and received his PhD in astronomy from the University of Maryland, United States. He is currently at the Raman Research Institute in Bangalore. His current research interests involve diffusion gas in the universe, intercluster and intergalactical medium, and interaction between galaxies and diffuse gas. His other uh, interest lays in popularizing science and writing science fictions. He has received the Indira Gandhi Award for Science Popularization from INSA in 2011. Professor Nath writes both in English and Bengali. Some of his books on the long list of his publication include the Story of Helium and the Birth of Astrophysics, uh, published in 2012, The Dawn of Universe, published in 2005, Eyes on the Uni Sky, The Story of Telescopes, published in 2009. We welcome Professor Nath and thank you for accepting our invitation. Please deliver your lecture. Thank you, Professor Das, and the organizers and the Office of Communication for uh, inviting me here. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the discovery of helium in particular, but as a way of illustrating how uh, uh, distortions uh, creep into the history of science, why do myths appear, and uh, instead of giving a general talk on myths and distortions in the history of science, I thought um, uh, it would be better to talk about a concrete example with the story of one uh, story first. And uh, I uh, use this as an illustration. So, um, let's talk about helium first. And why is it important? Why is the discovery of helium important? Well, so, helium, as you know, is the second uh, uh, lightest element that we are seeing in the periodic table. Um, and we all know that it's inert gas, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't interact with anything, any other element, not even itself. Um, and also, that it's rarely found on Earth. But it's found everywhere else because if you look at the whole universe, this is the pie chart of uh, abundances of elements, different elements by mass, uh, as determined by uh, astronomers. So, in the universe, if you take an inventory of all the elements, uh, roughly three quarters of it is made up of hydrogen, a quarter is uh, helium, and roughly about two percent by mass um, uh, contains. Uh, 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 is made of all the other elements in the periodic table. So it's the second most abundant element in the universe. And so it is not some element tucked away in a corner of the periodic table that, uh, whose discovery I'm going to talk about. It's also important for our story that this element was not discovered by chemists but by astronomers. And that makes the story interesting. Uh, more so, the it so happens that the, uh, the discovery of helium brought about the, uh, it made the uh, a new science of astrophysics emerge because that allowed um, the discovery of helium, allowed people to start talking about the physical properties of celestial objects and not just their position and movement in the sky. So that's, uh, that's what uh, astrophysics is studying. And what's interesting is that although this is important, as you can imagine, for, for more than one reason. Uh, reason. Uh, the, story, the story of its discovery is very good and often mistaken in the collective memory of scientists and students of science. Uh, to give you an example, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll probably let me just read the second quote first. Uh, this is uh, uh, from uh, Renaissance by Henry Baku. Founder of Indian Institute of Astrophysics, famous astronomer. Uh, um, and this is as quoted in a paper in Current Science by Thomas Chabau. The solar physics was born in the tobacco fields of uh, Guntu. And this is this is actually the sentence uh, which got me interested. I mean, it's a very dramatic way of putting it. Right? So I wanted to know more about what is what happened in Guntu, what is this tobacco fields, etc. etc. And it turns out that there are uh, it's not the whole story. And uh, so let's let me give an example of the venerable uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, um, where one finds that in 1868, while observing an eclipse 
whose part of totality passed over India, the French astronomer P.A. Johnson, uh, observed a bright yellow line in the spectrum. This is my highlighted uh, portion. Johnson noticed that the yellow line's wavelength was slightly shorter than that of the well-known line of sodium, and he reported his result to the British astronomer Joseph Norman Lockyer, who had mistaken this. This is actually all wrong. I'll give you more example. Uh, during uh, the Nobel Prize award ceremony in 1904, uh, 1904 uh, to William Lanzay um, uh, for the discovery of not only just helium but all, all the other noble elements, uh, um, um, the president of the Royal Swedish Academy of Science said, during the award ceremony by the way, the existence of helium was demonstrated by Janssen during a spectroscopic examination of the solar chromosphere in 1868 while making observations on an eclipse of the sun in India. Uh, this is also all wrong. Um, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, the only, strong, uh, the only historian who pointed this out was a French historian, uh, David Aubin, uh, who wrote in an article, it's a French article, um, in, I think it's this journalist, the, 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 the French counterpart of Scientific American. I don't know how to pronounce it, by the way. Uh, but this basically means that uh, Johnson did not, um, uh, this is too soon, Johnson did not discover helium. That's basically it. Uh, maybe who, uh, whoever knows French uh, 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 has already read it. The most interesting part of this story is that there was another person who had uh, a, a significant contribution to this story. And I'll tell you how uh, 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 slowly. Um, and his name has been totally forgotten. And this is the distortion, this is the myths that I want to tell you about and why these sort of myths have uh, appeared. And so let's just, just f first find out this story. Um, so let's, if we start at the very beginning, the uh, one has to start with the uh, discovery by uh, Fraunhofer, that uh, which he did in 1814, sitting in uh, Benedictine uh, Abbey near Munich. Uh, so this is the solar, uh, the spectrum of the sun, as you know. So you can see the continuum, all the continuum radiation from red to blue, but superposed on it, you will also see a series of dark lines, which uh, Fraunhofer we call them uh, Fraunhofer lines, and he named them uh, according to the alphabets. So this is the D line in in in, uh, in yellow, which we now know is due to sodium. Right. So, but the, it was not very clear at that time, not only in 1814, but people uh, struggled to understand the origin of these dark lines for almost four decades. Uh, in 18, okay, so these are some examples of, um, so for example, uh, John Herschel noticed that the different substances gave different sets of bright lines. Buster worked on it and then found that you know some of the dark lines and bright lines seem to coincide, and um, so there was some idea that you know probably one can infer one could infer the the, the composition of the sun from the spectrum, etc. Et et but it was not very clear. There was a buzz in the air. Uh, Leo Foucault came very close in 1849. He was a very versatile uh, uh, scientist, amazingly brilliant. Um, same Foucault as in Foucault's pendulum. Uh, this is uh, Foucault's pendulum in Ayuka in Pune. So what he did in 1849, he did an experiment. He passed uh, electricity uh, through an arc and uh, took its spectrum. So its, its spectrum gave a, a bright uh, line. Um, now we know that you know, uh, it's very easy to contaminate with common salt. So you will see uh, uh, the sodium line there. And then what he did, he passed sunlight through this uh, arc and he saw that uh, the, the dark line and the dark line and uh, the, the bright line seemed to uh, coincide. Not only that, the, the dark line seemed to have been strengthened by passing through the, the, the arc. And so he con uh, concluded that as the arc presents us with a medium that in its D days of its own, uh, account and which at the same time absorbs them when they come from another point. Okay. And so this is 1849. It took another 10 years till. Um, so um, 
uh, Leon Foucault was, as I said, it was a very, uh, it was a very versatile scientist, and then he moved on to some other topic. But he happened to mention this idea uh, uh, during a dinner at uh, Cambridge to Stokes, who in turn uh, told him to tell him about it. He himself uh, uh, left the topic and started working on lenses. So uh, it took another ten years till the theoretical genius of uh, uh, Kirchhoff and the experimental genius of Bunsen. They combined together and in 1859 they wrote a seminal paper. It's one of the you know, seminal papers in thermodynamics. Um, that they, so you see, the, so they discovered that you see the bright lines when you uh, 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 burn a gas and uh, when you put this gas in front of a, a continuous source of continuous light, uh, the same uh, uh, gas absorbs, absorbs in the same wavelength. So, the dark lines originate from the presence of these substances in the... So, his idea was that then the dark lines come from the outer surface of the sun, which then would basically uh, absorb certain frequencies uh, from the light that is coming from the core. That was the idea. So the dark lines originate from the presence of these substances in the solar atmosphere, which cause bright lines in the same place in the spectrum of a flame. So the same, so sodium in the solar atmosphere would cause a dark D line, whereas sodium, when you burn in the lab, would cause a bright D line in the same wavelength. And so, so um, they they continued. So they, they discovered. Um, right. So the, the, the questions like the sun had no dark lithium lines was passed through a limb, the flame through lithium for example showed dark lines. And so they started questioning whether one can identify elements in the sun. And so there was this story, uh, uh, one evening I think uh, about 10 miles uh, from their laboratory in Mannheim there was a forest fire and they turned their telescope towards the forest fire and they could identify some of the elements. And apparently, so this is from an article in Nature, by the way. I didn't um, write up the dialogues. Uh, so apparently, oh sorry, this, you know, this is Bunsen uh, saying, if we could determine the nature of substances burning in Mannheim, why couldn't we uh, do the same for the sun? Because said, Bunsen, I've gone mad. Uh, this is Bunsen again. Uh, so uh, have I, Kirchhoff. So they uh, then inferred the presence of these uh, some of these uh, uh, substances in the sun, and so here was a new way of identifying elements. So we didn't have to depend on you know chemists, and they started discovering new elements through their spectrum. They discovered cesium, rubidium in the lab, and um, elsewhere. William Crookes discovered thallium, and the the, the flavor of chemistry had changed. Um, so Kirchhoff also developed a mathematical theory of uh, absorption and emission uh, when matter and radiation are in equilibrium, which we now know is the you know the, the cornerstone of what you call the blackboard radiation. And uh, so we know that you know, blackboard radiation has this Planckian spectrum, irrespective of what it is composed of, but depending only on the temperature. So uh, uh, basically, that the emission in a spectral line is proportional to the absorption. In a dark line, and the ratio is universal, and uh, depends. Uh, and the opaque substance that absorbs all radiation falling on it will emit all colors. So this is black body radiation. Uh, it depends only on temperature. That paper was very very difficult. It's very mathematical. And uh, if I can tell you some of the um, uh, the reviews that came up of this paper. So this is a paper. Um, uh, this is a review that came out in the Chemical News in 1861, by the way. So the paper came out in 1859. 1859 is also a watershed uh, year for other uh, uh, fields of science. This is the year um, when Darwin published this Anyway, so Chemical News, the editor, I'm not going to tell you the name of the editor right now. I'm just showing you the picture uh, to be revealed later. Uh, uh, because these are all dramatic person for this story here. So we consider this law incapable of supporting the actual discoveries with the least cogency to be, to be untenable, notwithstanding the fact that it has generally been increased. So there's this Father Angelo Secchi. He was in Vatican Observatory in Roman College. Um, I'll, I'll tell more about him later, an astronomer, 
we wanted to say these things less to object to such a distinguished faces than to prevent science from taking a retrograde course, especially since history shows the persons of great authority in one branch of knowledge often drags along under the weight of their opinion, those who are less experienced. They are pretty uh, harsh criticisms. The, the point is that at that time, what Kirchhoff was proposing as the model of the sun, it was very different from the uh, the, the the model that was uh, in vogue at that time. So people were saying that you know uh, the core um, radiates all the uh, the continuum radiation, which means it's hot, and the atmosphere contains relatively cooler gas, which absorbs. And this is very different from the model of William Herschel, the discoverer of uh, Uranus, by the way. His model was that solar core is cold and the outer, the outer surface is hot. And so in Herschel's model, uh, sunspots were basically where clouds of the outer surface parted to give you a peak to the uh, cold core. Okay, so those, and this is totally different, opposite uh, to what Kirchhoff has uh, predicted. And that was, you know, one can understand that there's like some resistance to accepting new ideas. But Kirchhoff's idea had a testable prediction. He said that the gas, when it's hot, it emits bright lights of its own. So somehow, right now, when we see, look at the sun and they take the spectrum, then the solar atmosphere is relatively cooler, absorbs uh, some of the dark light and produces the dark light. But if you were to somehow just isolate the outer parts, then it is hot. It's relatively cooler, but it is hot. So that should, they, the outer parts should also be bright lines. The only, uh, the problem is how to then uh, isolate the main disk of the sun, which is very, very bright. Now, nature has a way of doing that during solar eclipse, right? So, there was this testable prediction that if you look at, uh, wait for a solar eclipse, um, then, and if you look at the spectrum of this uh, outer part, the Fraunhofer dark lines should reverse and become bright lines at the same wavelength. That's the testable prediction, right? And it turns out that there was going to be a solar eclipse um, uh, some years later, and it's 1868. So all these things were going on in the 1860s. And, uh, uh, and the 1868 telescope, uh, the eclipse was supposed to last for six minutes. By the way, six minutes is a long time. Uh, totality usually lasts for only a few minutes. So this would give uh, ample opportunity to test out all these ideas. And this paper was written by uh, uh, Mr. James Francis Tennant. So this is another uh, person in the story. Uh, he was, he uh, belonged to the East India Company Army, the Bengal Sappers. Um, he was mostly uh, connected with the, uh, the Geographical Survey, uh, the Trigonometrical Survey, and working on the East-West Corridor. In fact, he was the person who determined the, the, the coordinates of uh, Karachi, and he wrote papers. And he became interested in, in uh, while surveying, in the theodolite, and which is very uh, close to the telescope, uh, as you know. And he uh, became interested in the engineering uh, aspects of theodolites. And those uh, days, you know, if you have a, a, a very weight, uh, uh, a heavy theodolite, you need to balance the weight with uh, different uh, uh, balances, uh, the weights hanging from it. So he found a way of relieving the pressure through fluid, which became, by the way, later a cornerstone of other uh, designs of uh, large telescopes later. So this is what he was doing. Uh, and he wrote a paper in monthly notices of uh, uh, Royal Astronomical Society saying that uh, this totality is going to come and then this is the belt of totality is going to cross India. It's uh, August, 18th August. Uh, so, by the way, so he was writing this paper uh, just uh, this after, uh, after the civil mutiny. Yeah. So, during the mutiny, by the way, he was recalled from his uh, service in the Trigonometrical survey, and he was asked to defend Kashmir Gate. He fought in Kashmir Gate, then he was sent to Lucknow. And uh, he wrote a paper on the observatory of Wajid Ali Shah, by the way. What happened? Uh, the, uh, and the first uh, account and the detailed account that we have 
the only account that we have of Abdullah Sarki. And then he was involved in the lifting the battle of the siege of residency in Kebno. So uh, then he slowly became interested in astronomy and, 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 and left uh, the army. Uh, so here's pro probably a good place to include, uh, 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 talk about why the, the, these people, the, the people from army and the priest that I mentioned, uh, Angelo Sechi, they came in because of one, one of the reasons is that, you know, in traditional astronomy at that time, people were only interested in uh, the movement and the positions of objects in the sky. And the reigning philosophy at that time was the, you know, the positivism. And uh, it basically stated that it is futile to do research on problems which are unsolvable. Like finding the composition of the sun. Because we will never be able to test it out, so it is futile to do so. So that dissuaded a lot of traditional astronomers from this sort of line of thinking. And also, this new way of looking at things included uh, photography, uh, taking spectrum and dabbling in chemistry, which didn't really fit in with the plans of traditional observatories. So, uh, so, um, so uh, the new science of astrophysics basically attracted the disc takers. The, uh, the advanced part is scouting distance frontiers. And regular astronomers basically scoffed at the idea. This is what a famous astronomer was true say. God forbid that astronomy should be carried away by fascination with novelty and diverge from essential basis of basically position astronomy. We should only be doing, uh, looking at only the movement and positions of stars. Okay. Why should you want to know what the stars are made of? Anyway, so, so the new science of astrophysics uh, attracted these people. So these are you know, the heroes of uh, the beginning of uh, astrophysics and they're all uh, self-taught, they are all amateur astronomers. They have never, they have never been taught in regular um, uh, universities. So I told, told you about James Francis Tennant, who was basically an engineer. Um, so uh, let me talk about William Huggins. He was a silk merchant and uh, made a uh, built an observatory in his house in London. And with his wife, uh, he uh, uh, happened to attend a lecture by a student of Bunsen and became very uh, uh, enthusiastic about this idea of looking at the spectrum of stars. And they were the, uh, this couple, they were the first people to look at the stellar spectrum and um, they made a lot of discoveries. Uh, he was a paper merchant and became one of the pioneering uh, uh, astrophotographer uh, at the time. Um, Norman Lockyer, and this is the picture I had shown you earlier, Norman Lockyer as you know, is the founder of Nature. He was a clerk in the war office, and uh, he happened to move to Wimbledon, and he had a neighbor who happened to have a telescope, and so he became interested in astronomy, and he got a telescope of his own, started writing papers on the moon and the Mars, and then he met Huggins, and then became interested in solar uh, spectroscopy. So um, then there was this, this person, Father Sechi, he was a Jesuit priest, uh, uh, and as you know, when France attacked Italy, all the Jesuit priests had to uh, uh, they, they had to flee, and so he went to U.S. and studied uh, in University of Georgetown, uh, where he learned uh, astronomy. And then when he came back, uh, he was given the uh, job of uh, looking after the Vatican Observatory because the new pope at that time. Uh, this is the time where the nation building was going on, you know, uh, the Italy to be a nation. And the Pope wanted to show that, you know, well, uh, clergy is not anti scientific, not anti modern. So. so he wanted to, uh, so they, they gave a lot of money to uh, the observatory, bought a lot of telescopes and spectroscope. So uh, these are the, uh, the heroes of the amateur heroes. So this is uh, Huggins. Uh, the silk merchant I told you, and this is his wife, Mary Huggins. So, this is one of the uh, diary uh, uh, entries. Nearly every observation revealed a new fact. Almost every night's nice work was read by some discovery. This is in uh, 19, uh, 1862 or so. There's a, a very uh, nice biography of Huggins. Uh, this came up. I, the name of the author. Uh, I told you about Norman Lockyer. This is Sechi. Um, 
Right. So he set up new telescopes at the Vatican Observatory, and then in 1863 he had a young um, visitor from France, another interesting person, Pierre Johnson. Uh, he had uh, a childhood accident. He was dropped by his hire. And so he uh, he had an handicap. He, he used to limp while walking, and so he had problems. Um, but that didn't deter him from going all over the world. He didn't get a job in Paris Observatory that he really wanted, by the way. Um, uh, but he made uh, friends in the Academy, French Academy, and managed to uh, get a lot of grants to fund his projects. So he used to go to South America to climb Alps. Uh, and he found that, uh, and, and he also had uh, the one of the best uh, spectroscope, <coughs> spectroscope in, uh, in, in the world at that time. And he realized, he found that you know uh, some of these front of our lines change their strength while uh, 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 when seen from the uh, different heights. So some of the lines actually originated from the atmosphere. So he was working on that. Uh, yeah, so so between between the atmospheric and solar absorption lines in front of our spectrum. So when all these people heard about the the, the imminent uh, eclipse, they, they realized that this this is this must be used. Um, so uh, Janssen also wrote to the uh, Paris Observatory. Paris Observatory had its own idea. They totally sidelined Janssen, although he had the best spectroscope. They wanted to send a, a team to Thailand uh, without Janssen because the king of Siam that time was making overtures to the French. And uh, and the uh, and Pondicherry didn't lie on the uh, the political anyway. But Janssen was a very resourceful person. I mean, he managed to get a separate grant from the academy and decided to go to India alone. So uh, this, this is an example here. This is two years after this event. This is in 1870. There was another eclipse, total solar eclipse in Algeria. Um, no, this is right outside of uh, I forget where. Uh, the totality belt, and there was a siege of Paris by the Prussian army, and the Janssen could not go. And what he did, he was so desperate to uh, view the totality, he went on an airship and then <laughs> escaped the siege. So this is actually the, the, the picture. So it was a, there was this globe trotting scientist here. Now at, the, at this time in England, what? Huggins argued that well, we didn't need really an eclipse. I know that the outer part of the sun is reddish. So I could use a red filter to separate out, to, to mask out the main, uh, the main uh, disk of the sun. And he tried that, but he, he didn't, it was not successful. Lockyer said, well, I know there, there are prominences because there are the, the, the solar storms uh, which come out of the, you know, um, the outer surface. If I know this one of these prominences, then I can put my seed there and take its uh, spectrum. But then, you know, you have to really, what uh, in his language, fish around for the prominence. And he needed a bigger telescope, so he asked for a grant from the Royal Society. But the telescope maker fell in. So this is uh, summer of 1868. Uh, and Major Francis Tennant, he received a grant from the Royal Society to organize an eclipse uh, uh, team. Telescopes, photographic place. So the photography was a big thing at that time. Just about seven years ago, the first eclipse was photographed. So one and wanted to do this. And the, those days, uh, the films were of wet glass. It took a long time to develop, uh, more than half a minute. So six minutes would give you some time for uh, at least a few. So this is a nine inch uh, telescope that they got uh, set up in Ubuntu. Uh, and they also had polarizers. John Herschel. John Herschel was the son of uh, William Herschel, and John Herschel's uh, two sons were there in India. A younger son was in Bangalore. John, uh, his name was also John Herschel Jr. And uh, so he asked his younger son to take uh, 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 organize another expedition, and asked him to focus on spectroscopy. Everybody was uh, uh, focusing on spectroscopy because that's where you know uh, Kirchhoff's idea would be tested. But uh, there was another astronomer. From India, who was watching all this in silence and in agony, and he was Norman Poxon, who well, basically searched for astronomer again um, from Manchester. He uh, went 
as you work as an apprentice in uh, uh, Manchester, then became uh, a, uh, an employee of the Radcliffe Observatory in, in Oxford, where, by the way, he developed a way of uh, comparing the brightnesses of stars that we still use, the magnitude system, the Poisson system we still use. So this is Poisson, but he didn't have any Cambridge or Oxford degree. So without which it was very difficult to get jobs those days in England and to be counted as uh, regular scholars. So he applied for a job uh, at the Madras Observatory uh, as the government astronomer, which he was given, and then he came to India in 1861. This is the old Madras Observatory. Um, while he came, when he came here, there was this royal astronomer, who was George Ailey, the Ailey's disk in diffraction that we all know. Ailey, the idea was that uh, when Norman Paulson would come to India, he would basically tackle the southern stars. But as soon as he came to India, George Ailey said, no, uh, uh, you don't need to do this. Uh, the uh, other uh, Sydney Observatory is going to do this. And so at that point, the, 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 the communication between them became very, very bitter. And uh, Paulson's uh, letters became increasingly uh, you know, critical and bitter. And he used very colorful language. So uh, this is some of, from his uh, reports. Complained about salary, his uh, his projects and assistance. So the, most are dolts, <laughs> machines without this certain machinery. And the, he was also complaining about the living conditions. For example, first observations in India taken in the compound in happy, fearless ignorance of snakes, centipedes, scorpions, and all the filthy dangers vermin abounding in my new home. So he certainly used. Uh, very colorful language. So uh, what he did, he didn't have any the ground, right? And because he uh, he was not in good terms with his peers, so he organized the expedition thing on his own. Got some engineers from the railways and the telegraph, um, and and um, and to help him. So what he did is that he chose Mathipatnam, which was on the coast of Andhra, where also the totality was built within the totality belt. And there was a, a severe cyclone a few years ago um, in Masri Patnam. Killed a lot of people. So uh, the government was looking at a meteorological uh, office to be set up there. And he became uh, a government meteorological officer um, also. And he said, I'm going to set up a, a, a weather office there, station there. So, um, and he also get to, uh, managed to get a spectroscope from Huggins. And he, so, I've never been able to comprehend the peculiar ground upon which European observers justify the needless and lavish expenditure. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm probably going very slow. So let me uh, speed up a little bit. So they, uh, Tennant and Janssen, they came to Buntu. This is mainland, right? Um, they were from the coast. So this is a sketch of their tent that they set up. Okay, so 18th August, 1868, morning. Okay. So, um, the problem was, this is, this is monsoon time in India, so clouds are uh, going to be a, a problem. So, there was a morning mist and so everybody was uh, uh, worried whether this is going to be a uh, uh, hindrance. So, by, but about around 9 o'clock, the, the, the clouds uh, are cleared away. Tenants assistant focused on the photography, they took six snaps in six minutes. This is one of their uh, photographs, by the way, from 1868. But the crop drive uh, failed at the uh, crucial moment, so they had to do it manually. Okay, and Masri Patna, Boxen, uh was worried about a crowd gathered around his equipment, and this is what he wrote. The two inquisitive and meddlesome writers, who, not contented with looking, must finger the thermometers and temper with the instruments. But he, everybody saw that there was a bright line in yellow. So, front half of lines, dark lines. Did reverse. So Pilkov's ideas did materialize. Uh, so Janssen, Tennant, they saw a bright yellow line and thought that it was due to sodium. If you look at Janssen's paper, it does not mention that its, it's line is very different from sodium line. Okay? So that's the distortion in the history I'm talking about. Partial truth also. I mean, he said no question that the orange line was identified with D. Only Boxer was not very sure. So this is his hand-painted uh, um, uh, spectrum that you can see in the archive of Indian Museum of Astrophysics in Gormandra. 
you know, the line was either coincident or very near to it. And that was very crucial. Now, Johnson, what he did, he, uh, uh, he saw the prominences, right? And so he knew that, you know, I could probably do the same thing next morning also, because I know if the prominences don't really change their position very fast. So he woke up uh, very early, 3 a.m., uh, uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, and he put the slate at the prominences, and he saw the black lines again. So he realized that you don't need to wait for the eclipse. I can do this anytime. And so he sent a telegram to, uh, to Paris and decided to study more before sending a detailed report. On uh, 19th September, he sent the detailed report. But he sent a telegram to Paris. Lockyer and others heard about this discovery. Yeah. Uh, Lockyer got his telescope on 20th October, by the way. And that day, he go to the office. He, uh, in the morning, he tried putting on a slate on a prominence and saw the bright line uh, in the spectrum, including the yellow line here D, and sent a brief report to the French Academy on 20th October from London. And uh, Johnson had sent it, this from Akinara, um, a, a detailed report. By the way, the telegram was sent from Vijaywara. The telegraph line was, had been just uh, set up a few months ago in 1868 through Iran and Afghanistan mm -hmm. by Siemens Company. Anyway, so uh, I'll now talk about uh, the details. I have written a book some time ago about where you can read the details. So um, what Johnson saw is, in the, uh, is that I can do this, the bright lines, without the aid of eclipses. So he <coughs> called it perpetual eclipse. Right? And these two letters, one sent from India on 19th September from Akira, one sent on 20th October from London, they both reached on 24th October in Paris within a few hours. That was an amazing event at the French Academy that they thought they must celebrate this. And they so uh, they uh, declared them joint discoverers, not of helium by the way, of a method of studying the sun without the aid of eclipses. Right? So, uh, and both the uh, uh, faces were there. Um, so they were joint discoverers. So, and then Lockyer then went on to discover the chromosphere, the, the outer surface of the sun, which is reddish. Um, his discoveries were very impressive, but he made, he was very critical and was very uh, harsh. And his aggressive nature made many uh, enemies. Uh, started collaborating with uh, uh, a, a, a chemist, Edward Franklin, who gave the word tendency. Uh, you know. Look for, they thought this. D3 line, the third line, right? Uh, in they thought it's maybe it's uh, coming from hydrogen under some other conditions like uh, high pressure or something. They couldn't uh, 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 succeed. And Lockyer thought that you know maybe it's a different element and uh, uh, name uh, he named this helium. But Franklin objected to this hypothesis. I remember always protesting about the yellow line about this assumption. Let's flash forward how historians later have remembered this. This is Charles Young, an astronomer, uh, American astronomer, wrote in 1896, a year after the discovery of helium, by the way. Most of the observers of 1868 supposed it to be helium light. But Johnson noted its non coincidence. Franklin proposed the, for the new substance a provisional name of helium. All three of them are wrong. Franklin did not do that. Okay? He actually objected to this. The only astronomer, to the best of my knowledge, who has written just succinctly exactly what happened was Sudhamanian Chandrasekhar, who wrote in 1947, referring to the yellow line, Foxham said that it was at or near G, almost the whole of story of helium depends on this distinction. This is as clear as you can get, but this is uh, this is not how most of it is remembered. Anyway, Charles so Young discovered that uh, uh, next year, uh, two years later, there was a uh, uh, Reason from US, and they discovered a, a green line who he named Coronia. By the way, the green line was seen by Oxen also. Right? But some suspected that maybe helium and coronium are the same element. So there are a lot of people, there's a lot of confusion at that time. Everybody could see a new line and they thought it's a new element. So now we know that there are lines, there are forbidden lines which uh, are not seen in terrestrial uh, atmosphere because of. Uh, high density, which you can see only from space because of the uh, low density. 
So uh, for the Bonhagens, found a new line that planetary level and things is well, and, and named it Megulio. Right. So there's a lot of confusion. Right? D3 was uh, uh, was discovered in a nova in uh, 1876. Uh, also the green line. There was even more confusion. There was a terrestrial claim that uh, uh, of, from um, uh, the geologist Onmeri. He said that when he uh, claimed to have seen helium from a uh, substance he collected during an expedition at Vesuvius, but he didn't preserve his sample, so uh, that claim went away. And this line was then discovered in Orion Nebula in 1886. That gave the idea that, okay, you see helium everywhere else, but not on Earth. So maybe, see, at that time, uh, we knew that, you know, uh, the William Proud's idea that, you know, the weights of the atoms are integral multiples of that fundamental element. So initially they thought that, you know, it's hydrogen, but then, you know, some elements have non uh, integral weight, like chlorine being 35.5. So at that time, the idea of isotope was not there. So people didn't understand how uh, one could um, uh, explain this. So Lockyer suggested maybe uh, helium uh, represents some more elementary form of matter, which is possible only at very high temperature. And when it condenses, then only uh, you see other elements. You don't see helium at all. So matter evolved and cooled from this primal matter in nebula to stars. So helium could be this primal matter, and if helium is uh, lighter than hydrogen, say half a hydrogen uh, weight, then one could explain uh, this fractional weights. That was the idea. And in fact, William Crookes gave a, a, a lecture on 1886 in the British Association for Advancement of Science. Uh, for him, the primal matter could be a formalness mist, a substance with the potential of becoming and evolving into uh, into atoms, but at that time, you know, Crookes was going through his reputation was a, 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 in tatters because he was um, known to have attended seances and you know, um, defending spirits and mediums. So, if such a person starts talking about formless mist, uh, you, you don't take them seriously, right? And of course, the high priest of chemistry at that time, Mendeleev, he dismissed astrophysics totally. He gave the Faraday lecture in 1889 and he said that astrophysics is. Still, for want of cause, at the epoch of uh, accumulation of facts and not of uh, the position. But he was curious about helium. He went up alone in a balloon uh, to observe uh, during a total solar eclipse in 1887, where it came, became cloudy. Um, but by the way, he was also not uh, uh, shy away from uh, uh, speculating. In 1903, he suggested that there was two more noble gases, which he named neutronium and coronium, uh, and that they had atomic weight less than hydrogen. By the way, this is Mendeleev's idea. This is the label. Okay, so Janssen at the time had moved away from all this. He had come to uh, India in 1871 once and saw another eclipse where he actually made a very interesting discovery of uh, the correlation between corona and uh, in correlation and sunspots. And then he invented something very interesting uh, the photographic revolver, just like uh, the Paul's idea of revolver where you have six um, uh, chambers, right? So you can revolve around them. But suppose you have cameras all around them and you can revolve them. You can have a moving camera. This is the precursor of a uh, uh, movie camera. And this guy had gone to 18, uh, Nagasaki in 1874 and watched the uh, transit of Venus. This is, by the way, probably the first movie that you can talk about. Okay, This is by Janssen. I'll show this again. So Venus is shown to be transiting. This is with his uh, camera. And uh, so <coughs> in 1895, um, there was a conference on movie cameras, and the Lumiere brothers um, uh, and had made a movie where you can see Janssen walking in front. So he was a hero for the the other uh, parts. Paulson died in 1891. Uh, ignored by his peers. He was not chosen the director of the new observatory in uh, Korai Canal. Uh, this is his room in, 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 in Madras, in St. George's Church. Um, there's a lot of things happening in, in, on the, the Huggins fought with Lockyer about Regulium. Lockyer thought it was a uh, thing that was magnesium and nothing else. And the nasty word of uh, words began. Uh, Huggins complained to Hale, George Hale in, uh, in America, that those attacks of Lockyer Giving us much pain, it's difficult to keep them from.
from eating out of our lives of glory. So at that time, um, uh, a, a paper came out of a, a geologist in the US, uh, William Hilbert. He found nitrogen from uranite and the, bus, but the gas showed some unusual spectrum lines. This paper was uh, lying for about eight years um, without anybody having noticed. And the mineralogist from the British Museum uh, looked at it uh, eight years later and then alerted Jalin and Ramsey, who were also looking at the nitrogen light gases and they discovered the inner gases. And they were working up right. And the Ramsey then collected the uh, gas from a sample of Cleveland, which is a similar uh, uh, mineral like uranium. And William Crookes then saw the helium line in the spectrum. It was confirmed that this is helium. So, Lockyer uh, wrote a, a, a two part article in Nature in 1896. Um, the 26 year old helium had at last been come to Earth. The DT was at last visible in the laboratory. And this is uh, called the story of helium. And where he doesn't say a word about Janssen, by the way, but he mentions his size Posen. Um, there was some uh, confusion around that time. Rogan and Pashen say that okay, the helium line is not one, but there were two lines. Uh, so Huggins thought, okay, uh, he wrote two. Uh, Ailes into the helium from Higgins. Lockyer wanted to name another, uh, give another name. He uh, suggested that maybe we should call it Asterium, but others sort of dissuaded him. And much later, of course, after the advent of quantum helium, now we know that there are two kinds of helium, ortho helium and para helium, depending on the relative uh, the spin configurations of the two uh, electrons. Um, now, this is the story of helium, and why is that? We remember the helium story so in, in such a mistaken manner. Uh, my take is that with a couple of reasons. One is that the uniqueness of Lockyer and Janssen's story, the coincidence of their two letters arriving at the same time, it was such a novel thing, and there was no priority issue. Remember, uh, uh, just before that, there was this priority issue about uh, the discovery of Neptune between the British astronomers and the French astronomers, and there was no issues. They, they were friends, good friends, Janssen and Lockyer. So this was an unheard of thing in Europe at that time. Um, and uh, then he disputed about priority and has the, uh, you know, um, so this has all the key requirements of a good story. So for having romanticizing the past, so what they did has been largely forgotten except the fact that they discovered something together, right? <laughs> Secondly, the, the, the flavor of astrophysical research has totally changed by it. From in the, uh, the middle of 19th century, where it was operated mostly by the amateurs, it was now the, uh, the the realm of the professional astronomers, large observatories. So people had really forgotten what actually was discovered 50 years later. And um, so by the end of 19th century, you know, when the astrophysics went out of the realm of amateurs to professionals in large observatories. So coming to in general, why are there the myths in science history. One of the reasons I think, for example, Galileo really never dropped the ball from the business, uh, the leading tower. This story has been uh, popularized by one of his students who wrote this book 75 years after Galileo's death. During, no contemporary of Galileo has written any account of this. Benjamin Franklin never flew a kite. Right. Uh, so, uh, a lot of things have been written on uh, debunking this myths. Um, so, actually the research, scientific research is never, it's always a multi-participant activity. Right? Here are the moments uh, of the myths. Um, so here I think, these are some of the reasons that I can think of. So for example, the fact that it's, a, it's a usually things are multi-participant activity. Also, we tend to look at the past from the lens of the present. So Stephen Jay Gould calls it present. Uh, uh, it's a mistaken use of present criteria, criteria to judge a distant and different past. So it favors the successful researchers and ignores the also ends. Right? Um, and so that uh, so the, this is why hero worship is so abundant in history of science. Um, we also tend to prefer a linear story. And then a complicated non-linear narrative, right? 
John Warner has written a very interesting book on this, and he says that the blind alleys, false sense, and dead ends are overlooked in history of science. Sometimes scientists themselves distort the story to, to throw people off the scent of something uh, embarrassing. For example, one knows the uh, myth of Lister, Joseph Lister, is we give the credit uh, to him to, uh, uh, for the idea of uh, making uh, hospitals very hygienic. But the actual reality of his, the hospitals under his care are dismal. Um, here, let me tell you about this new book. It's not a new book, it's uh, almost 15 years old now. It's about pastors. Sometimes we want to make we, we as scientists, we, I think we want it because most of us came to science by reading stories about scientists. And when these myths are broken, we don't like it. And this is an example. Uh, this is by Giesen, um, it's from Princeton University, and it's a Princeton University uh, press, uh, Princeton and Legacy Library. Uh, he's a historian of science, and he wrote this book on Pasteur by examining the diary of Pasteur, which was amazing enough not done earlier. And uh, it reveals a lot of problem claims, by the way. All the stories that you have heard and we have heard with read uh, uh, as children about rabies and all that, all wrong and all made up. And if you look at the pastor's uh, diary, you can see that. And then Gisson's book actually is it. This is not the point. You can read this book. I, I'm not sure uh, IAC library has a copy. What is interesting is when this book came out in 1997, I think, the, the criticisms of scientists themselves, that's very interesting. And that's what I want to read. But this is, a, I'm going to read from, um, uh, an article resuscitating the great Dr. Uh, uh, the history and poetics of scientific biography. Debunking biographies appeal to even fewer readers than do celebratory tales. People don't like them. Humans react defensively and offensively to attacks on a flawed but nonetheless brilliant professor. General uh, Giesen's book, The uh, Private Science of Louis Pasteur, might fit the bill. For his uncompromising remarks about the ethics of Pasteur's research, and notwithstanding the archival evidence he used to bolster his claims, Gieson was roundly attacked by the mighty pens of Latou, the Nobel laureate Max Perrault. As if, how dare you attack our heroes of science? So we, we want myths. I mean, we just don't want myths. Sometimes we, I feel that you know, we want to be embalmed in myths of science. Otherwise, uh, you know, the whole idea of coming to science maybe, I mean, it, it, uh, falls apart. So, and, uh, you know, we like to romanticize the past, don't we? So, so John Waller writes, this has led to the reshaping of accounts of major discoveries into fireside stories, much richer in drama than in veracity. So, I'll, I'll end here. And, and there are lots of other stories of, uh, uh, of discoveries in, in history of science, and more I look at each of them, I find that there are a lot of troubles with these stories. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nan. It was an engaging lecture, and so we hear such lectures very rarely. Thank you. So we'll take a few questions. Thank you. Um, from what you said, Oxen sort of faded from the picture. He yes. said something rather uh, tentative, ambiguous, and then disappeared from the scene. So, at what point did people conclude that there was this element? Because that wasn't very okay. clear. Who so, one of the things that I, I forgot to mention is that Oxen's report was never formally published. It appeared in good journals. A, I don't know the reason. It, it was published uh, by uh, the public post department in Madras uh, Presidency. So, according to Rock here, it was Oxen's that sense of uncertainty was a clue to Rock here. And it took, of course, uh, from 1868 to 1895 to actually find that the evidence. Uh, didn't didn't he, he did it. Yes. So the story of William that uh, uh, Lockyer wrote does not mention Jansen. 
But nowadays, if you look at Wikipedia, it says Janssen and Lockyer are the joint discoverers of uh, helium. Oxen's name is. Now I think I this book, the Wikipedia, they have changed the uh, line a little bit. Uh, the Poxon's name has been introduced, so I'm, I'm glad they have. They have. This is a side story, and you, know, you mentioned the positivism of, of which the movement of which Amita was one of the. What is the reason for calling that positivism? This is I have also not figured, but um, uh, I really don't know. Maybe you know one should do uh, research on. Something that one really is positive about. I mean, I don't know what that, in that sense or not. Um, yes. Uh, actually, I had to say, we had to study these things for our entrance exam. Okay. Uh, so all of these philosophies come up. That. Entrance exam for? Uh, so basically, a uh, joint. Uh... So exams like the Nigerian and uh, stuff like that. Okay. So uh, there you have to briefly study. Uh, the uh, different philosophies of science. Okay. So positivism, that word basically comes from what you can positively test. So exactly as you were saying that if it is in a distant star and I can test it, what does it matter? What's it? So that's how the name came, came about that what you can test out uh, by yourself, that is what you should focus on. Okay. All right, thank you. So how do you think about positivism? Thank you, that was an interesting talk. Thank you. And uh, I couldn't help noticing the similarity between uh, you know, the, the push for a, the positivist uh, approach uh, and the way cognitive science was once pursued. So there was a brief period uh, in the history of cognitive science uh, called behave the behaviorist movement, uh, you know, where uh, everybody was discouraged from looking into the mental processes and they were only asked to focus on the behavior because they said that's all you can measure and that's all you can see. So it's startling the, the similarity. But I, I had a question. Um, I mean, that's in your. Yeah. I mean, it's. I think even uh, on a deeper level, there's, there is a parallel between the two fields because you can't actually you know, stick a probe into the sun and see what's happening. Everything's happening. So is this debate still uh, going on? Now? Oh, no, 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 no. Thankfully not. Uh, actually, the problem was there weren't enough tools to, uh, you know, look inside. And once those uh, became developed, then you know there was more acceptance for the idea that you could access those mental processes. And uh, so, in fact, that then led to this fantastic idea that you're uh, not born with a blank slate. You have innate structures already in place in the brain, uh, which is what allows you to uh, learn. I mean, you can't learn if there's absolutely nothing. This is when? Around when? Uh, this would be again 1800s. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the transition happened in the 1800s, uh, but that was a really dismal time actually for the behaviorists. And also, uh, that was partly because uh, you know they were trying to rebel against this, uh, you know, this class system of of Europe. Uh, you know where. There was this idea that if you're born into a high family, you're intelligent naturally. So they were trying to say that your insights have nothing to do with anything. It's just your behavior and that anybody can just learn and be intelligent. So they went sort of to an extreme other, other, uh, and, and other and end. And they said, let's not even look inside. It's really interesting history. I, I <laughs> yeah. So now I had a question. In your opinion, you know, Fake news is like everywhere these days, and it's so much more easier for this kind of thing to happen today. Sure. So, what do you? I mean, do you think uh, we're more honest in the way we, uh, you know, report science, or like 25 or 30 years down the line, will we have uh, an accurate picture of what happened today? Uh, I don't think so. I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, uh, um, as I said, you know, we we want the myths. And I, the the way science research has um, moved uh, or evolved in the last uh, few decades, 
I think truth has become a, a first casualty. I mean, now we write papers to get past the referees, don't we? This is, I mean, what do we really want to convey what we have discovered? We want citation in place. We want institute findings to. We want to push that up. Truth is, uh, is one of the incidental uh, interests now, I think. I, I, that's what I feel in this way, uh, things are moving. But um, I just um, was teaching a course on history of science in my institute. And I was telling the students that you know, um, the, to be open to um, all the criticism, all, 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 the, all, all aspects of uh, uh, any uh, news or, or, or any events, and try to look at the primary sources as much as possible. Uh, because the secondary sources are always. So when I went to uh, uh, read the actual uh, the original papers by uh, Johnson, the letters that he wrote, I got them translated. And then I got an idea of uh, uh, what was happening at that time. All the secondary sources were wrong. But the primary sources, as far as possible, contemporary sources. People writing at that time are actually more honest about what, what was happening then. The reshaping happens slightly later. So, 1895, so for example, when uh, uh, Lockyer wrote his uh, story of Helium in 1896, that's more honest. Within 5 10 years, some other story began to take shape. So, primary sources, contemporary sources, I, I think these are more reliable. And they uh, give you a better picture of and, and about fake news. So, by that to come, Chat GPT would be like a tertiary or fourth order. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Order. That's even. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know to use dangerous or something. I don't know where we are going. So, yeah. If somebody starts using Chat GPT reports for I mean, people. And already, I mean, it's not been a year now, and you know, things have uh, become. Yeah. The primary source, what you are telling, that uh, even today it applies. If there is no record of what time, what thing happened at the time, we in, in India every time record. Yes. You know, there is nobody to write, there is nothing to write. So, even for example, the people say of what Sai Baba did, Mahatma Gandhi did, they are no primary source. So today what people say, you are real. And maybe you, you say many things are you know, imagination or uh, you know, some people like the high pitch. And uh, so it's very archive is very important. Yeah, yeah, archive is very important. If we go to archive, we, we hear so many stories. And sure. they are all most exaggerated. And imagination. So that sometimes, you know, as you say, uh, one would be wishful thinking. <laughs> But sometimes it's surprising to think that you know even it's just science. Well, science uh, we yeah. we we, uh, we take pride in looking for the truth, right? Yeah. Even there, there are lots of myths and distortions. That was the most surprising thing for me. Can you just put some of these in the uh, time sequence? Uh, Crooks, you mentioned all the seances and rubbish. Um, when, where was Dalton and all this, and when did Boltzmann come, and when, when was the atomic hypothesis uh, sort of accepted? Dalton uh, was prior to this, before Prout, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I don't want to record it. So that, 18. Dalton. Crooks is, yeah, is, is, this is 1880s. Uh, so Dalton is. Much, much earlier. And the Prout basically took, took up this idea that you know, it's a, a integral multiples of one. That is after that, post that. Okay. Boltzmann is another story. A statistical. So around the same time, 18, uh, end of 19th century, I think. He, he was also a strong proponent of the atomic hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, but uh, not about. Um, he was more interested in the you know, statistical uh, uh, nature. Comment, uh, uh, do you want to also encounter the story of uh, expansion of the universe? 
in the context of this original discoverer of the expansion of the universe and the credit is being given to Hubble. Oh, it's a cipher. Yeah. This was cipher. Yes. Well, yeah, there is. So, Lechit was actually found by Slifer and the... Very interesting, right? No, he was... He, this was Slifer was in Lowell, was it? In Kharsta. Yeah. Um, so, I think we have collected it now. This, uh, but was not with the original discoverer of the expansion of the universe. Before that, somebody from the... I forget the name. Do you mean Lomet? Lomet? Oh, oh, so, but that yeah. was a theoretical idea. Hmm. Like and he predicted that you know there's so he predicted and then uh, so uh, yeah now, so now so both are how will limit a uh, uh, air consumption so both are being so that's Belgian at least hmm. yes yes that's also very muggy uh, very really muggy story the the way it actually happened hmm. it's not a linear story at all <laughs> thank you. Nobody has any question, we'll call it a day today. Thank you for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.